Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Never doubt God. The Bible says very clearly, God cannot lie. Therefore, one who is wise, a true believer, is going to want to base his or her life upon the Word of God. So again, never doubt God. And I do not know why so many people do not believe what God has said. For example, in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, John writes down these words. He says, I have written to you that you will believe in the name of the Son of God. Believing in the name, knowing his identity, who Messiah is, and what he has done, gone to that cross, that he has been raised from the dead victoriously, so that you might believe in the name of of the Son of God and through believing that you will know hear that that you will know that you have eternal life you know what that scripture tells us that a person can know that they have eternal life now how can we know that anyone who is in Messiah is a new creation what does that mean we have been born again We are different. We are a new creation. Those old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. So if you have been born again, that means this, through your faith in the gospel message, through that work of Messiah, his death, burial, and resurrection, you receive that by faith. You take hold of the grace of God, a free gift so that you will be eternally redeemed, becoming that new creation. Here's the problem. Many people don't know what salvation is. They believe it's like having a ticket. And they have that ticket, but maybe they'll lose it. Maybe they'll they'll give it away. Maybe he'll take it back that he's changed his mind. Nowhere in the scripture is salvation spoken of as a ticket. No, when one is saved, it causes them to be different eternally. They are no longer that old man. They become that new man. That's what the scripture says. And therefore, if you've been born again, you're that new creation. Nothing ever, ever, ever can change that. And I have assurance. Why? Because the scripture tells me this. The good work that he has begun in me. When did he begin it? the moment that I believed. It says the good work that he's began in me, he's faithful to complete it in the day of Messiah Yeshua. So all of this gives me assurance. I know I have eternal life. And by the way, in that passage from 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13 where it says, I've written to you, that that you will believe in the name of the Son of God and by believing that you will know that you have eternal life. That word know is not the Greek word gnosko, but it's the word oida. Now, they both mean know, but listen to this. The word oida always has to be in a specific grammatical construction that speaks about something happening in the past, and brings about a reality and that reality is still true in the present and it will continue to be true on into the future so when it says in first john 5 verse 13 that you might know that you have eternal life you knew it when the day you were saved 
And you know it now, whether that was five years ago, 10 years ago, 50 years ago, makes no difference. The same reality is true now, and it will continue to be true. Praise God. You didn't have anything to do with it. You didn't work it out. You received it by faith, a free gift. Now, I realize that there are many scriptures that people look to, for example, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. It says, if someone willfully sins, what does that mean? If you do a good study of that word, it means one who chooses sin, sin over. They, they've come to recognize the truth, but they don't want that. They want sin. It doesn't say that they have been saved. It says that they have willfully wanted sin. They recognize the gospel. doesn't mean that they believe it. But they have chosen sin. And what it's saying is this. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. Why? They hear, okay, the gospel's this. Uh, that doesn't convince me. I don't want that gospel. I'm choosing sin willfully. If they don't choose the gospel, if they don't believe in the sacrifice Messiah said, there is no other. That's all it's trying to say. If you choose sin and reject the gospel, there's no other way. There's no other means for you. God's not going to do something more, something different because you like sin better than the gospel. There no longer remains any sacrifice for you. Now, that's in the present. Can a person repent of that, choose and say, you know what? I rejected the gospel in the past, but today I want to receive it. Of course they can. Now, why do I say that? Well, also in the book of Hebrews chapter 6, there's another very important passage. And there it says, if someone has tasted the heavenly gift and, and it uses a word that's very important, and, and if such a person, they would, would turn away, what happens? It's impossible to renew them again to salvation. Why? Well, the language here is speaking about a hypothetical situation. Why? Because you can't lose your salvation. For those who say they can, realize what Hebrews chapter 6 is saying is this. If you can lose your salvation, well, what saved you? Well, the cross, what Messiah did. Here's the problem. If him doing that work of salvation, which God received by raising him from the dead, that resurrection is a testimony of God's receiving, that it was perfect. It was sufficient. It was the work of redemption. And if you could lose it, well, what happens? Well, should we have him go and try again? Well, the scripture says, read it carefully in Hebrews 6. That would open him up to public shame. Yeah, you went to the cross, you died, you suffered, but it didn't, didn't hold. D do it again. Is that what you believe? No, what Hebrews 6 is saying is this. If, and again, it's hypothetical. If you could lose your salvation, that would mean that you would be in a situation whereby you could never be saved again. So if, if the gospel saved you and you lost it, he's not going to go to the cross. There's nothing more. If it wasn't good enough to do what it promised, to give you eternal life, you, you lost it, then there does not remain any means for you to ever be saved. Now, I don't know of any scripture that says that a person loses their salvation and then becomes unable to be saved. Why? Because he can't lose it. Every day for a person who's not a believer can be the day of salvation. All they have to do is to say yes to the gospel. So you don't lose your salvation. And we're going to look at a scripture that says that same thing today when you understand what Peter writes. Look with me to 2 Peter and chapter 2. Now, we began this, this chapter a few weeks ago. And do you remember how it be, began? Peter speaking and he says, as there were false prophets in the past, meaning that plagued Israel, 
there's going to be false teachers in the last days that is going to be within the church now remember what messiah says in matthew 24 he says there are going to be those that will come in my name and say i meaning the messiah is the messiah that he's savior so they're saying we're coming in christ's name and we're saying that yeshua is the messiah and what are they false teachers they are workers of deceit so false teachers are always a problem and they're going to increase so says peter in the last days in fact if you were to ask me what is peter speaking about throughout this second chapter it is false teachers now false teachers not everything they say is false they say a lot of good things and they profess to be real believers they they speak many things that are wonderful but remember this adage a little bit of arsenic can ruin a perfectly good meal and a little bit of heresy a little bit of false teaching can bring about a disaster for people for the non-believer and for the true believer that's why doctrine is so important well we concluded our study last week with verse 15 and there we talked about Balaam, also known as balaam in english and remember we read about him in the book of numbers and there was a king the king of moab hired him to curse israel and in the end although he said a lot of good things in the end he did just that why well we learned why last week it says in that last verse verse 15 because he loved the wages of unrighteousness let me tell you no true believer loves the wages the outcome of unrighteousness a true believer we accept the gospel because we want to turn away from sin we don't choose willfully sin do we sin sometimes yes we do can we rebel yes we can but it's temporary and it grieves us we are convicted almost instantaneously by the holy spirit there's no lasting joy or gratitude of that sinful act and we are repentant now it may not happen in a day or a week but soon thereafter the holy spirit he will work on us and we will be brought to repentance that's an assurance of the faithfulness of the holy spirit tells us in the scripture that he will lead us in truth and in righteousness look if you would to verse 16 speaking about bilam says but he had reproof someone reproved him for his behavior in regard to his own transgression and who was that a mute donkey now we all know the story of bilam how this donkey spoke to him and how that donkey spoke truth to one who was supposed to be a prophet he heard from god but he wasn't faithful so look at what it says a mute donkey this was the one who reproved him in a man's voice he spoke and what did this donkey do he stopped the the craziness of the prophet unfortunately only momentarily until that that wicked man carried out his scheme verse 17 now i mentioned to you that throughout this second chapter the subject has been false teachers and now it's going to describe bilam and these other false teachers what are they like look at verse 17 these are waterless wells now a well if it's a true well it has water in it but these are wells that are without water meaning this their exterior looks right 
They have a shape. They have a presentation that they are a well, but without water. So they're lacking what really makes a well a well. Secondly, if you look, it says clouds, clouds by the storm, meaning a tempest, a strong wind being driven to whom and it's speaking about these false teachers to whom the gloom of darkness forever they have been reserved for so this gloom of darkness is reserved forever for them now pretty strong words but again they're unstable they they are driven by the wind meaning the natural not the supernatural they are empty they have an external look but inwardly they lack what makes them what they should be they lack water they're not a blessing but they are dangerous and that's why it's been reserved for them this gloom of darkness forever verse 18 for arrogant and they are arrogant they are unknowing as well and they utter words of futility of vanity why do they do that enticing with fleshly desires in sensuality and it says they do that to the ones fleeing from the ones that are are living in the air so there's ones who are living in air meaning in sin in the mistake in falsehood there's other ones who are fleeing from them meaning they live differently they don't live in the air they live live in the truth and these false teachers what do they do they go after ones who are fleeing now all of this shows their wickedness the evilness and notice what else the word of god says about them look now to verse 19 being proclaimers of liberty to them now very important that we see this word liberty or freedom they always talk about liberty or freedom why well true biblical freedom and liberty is found in redemption and the best example of this is the passover through the blood of the lamb the children of israel came out of egypt out of bondage and god led them where to mount sinai there god gave them his commandments his instructions so they were set free in order to to serve him well these false teachers proclaim a totally different liberty they want to entice people with sensuality and in the desires of the flesh that's what we saw in the last verse so they proclaim proclaim freedom or liberty to them but notice what it says those being servants of corruption for to what one submits this one also is a slave so if you submit to something you become a slave to that and this is the false teachers this is what they do look again these are the ones who being servants or slaves of what corruption now that word also leads to destruction for to what a certain one submits to this one also he serves verse 20. now verse 20 is where it gets very very interesting now i want to read something to you because there's a very important word that begins this first verse or first verse 20 the first word of verse 20 and it's the word a now what does it mean well i'm reading from strong's concordance a very reliable one not perfect but but usually pretty good at least it gives you the citation so that you can do your own study to see how this word is used but notice what it says here this word a is a conditional conjunction 
expresses a condition thought of as real or to denote assumptions which are viewed as factual. But listen to this, for the sake of an argument. Did you hear that? Let me say it again. This word, oftentimes translated if, it is a conjunction of condition. It expresses a thought that is normally thought of as real or legitimate, or it denotes an assumption which is viewed as factual, but again, only for the sake of argument or illustration. Now, let's put it into a simpler way of understanding it. It oftentimes, now this word can have different purposes to it, but in this case, it introduces a hypothetical situation. It wants us to learn something. Look at verse 20. For if fleeing, fleeing the pollution of this world, if if this one has done that, these false teachers, if they have fled from the pollutions of this world in, notice this next, next word, the knowledge. But it's not the word knowledge. Now, I mentioned the word knowing a few minutes ago based upon 1 John 5, 13, and it was the word oida. This is a word gnosko, but gnosko means to know something in a general sense. But what's important is this. It's epigonosko. There's a prefix onto it. And what does that mean? That simply means to recognize something. Now, it does not mean to know it personally, having accepted it, believe it, know it to be true from within yourself. It simply means that you have recognized something. This is so important. What they have done is this. Look at verse 20. For if fleeing the the pollution of this world by the recognition of the Lord and Savior, Messiah Yeshua, So a hypothetical situation, if this is what they've done, but again, these ones are entangled and submit, meaning just like we saw, submit to the same sinful influence, the the desires of the flesh. If this is what they do, notice what it says. Unto them shall be a worse end than the beginning. So it's giving a situation, assuming something for the sake of argument. Very important that we see this. Verse 21. For better for them, if they had not recognized that same word, not recognized the way of righteousness, then recognizing it, they, they recognize All of this, they understood it. But what did they do? They turn from the holy commandment. Here, I believe that's the gospel. They turn from it that had been delivered over to them. Now, very important that we understand what it's saying here. These individuals have recognized the way of salvation. They they know it. They can share it with others even. They can espouse it, but They have only recognized it. And what he's saying here, this next part, what I read earlier, verse 21, for it's better that that for them who, who, that they would not have recognized the way of righteousness, then having recognized it, turn from the holy commandment that had been delivered to them. So it would have been better. Why? There is going to be greater punishment. Learn this. The scripture says it'll be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than for Bethsaida, Chorazin, and Capernaum. Why? They were confronted with the truth. They were given the truth, and they rejected it. Sodom and Gomorrah, they didn't have that same revelation. They didn't have Messiah coming and preaching and teaching them. Therefore, on that day of judgment, it's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than Bethsaida, Chorazin, and Capernaum. 
That's what he's saying here. These, it would have been better for them not to have recognized it than rejecting it. And what's it like? Well, look at the last verse, verse 22. It says, but what has happened to them is this true parable. What parable? Well, a dog returns unto its own vomit. Now, a dog, he ate something, made him sick. He vomited out, but he goes right back for it. Why? Instinct. He's in bondage to his stomach. Dogs are consumed with eating. And if they see something, they eat it. That's their nature, their normal nature. Also, it says here, and the sow, a large pig, being washed, what happens? Being washed into the wallowing of dirt. Does, she doesn't understand. She's been clean. She is clean. She goes right back to it. Why? That cleaning had no impact upon her. That vomit had no impacting on the dog. They go back to the natural. Why? They are a dog or they're a pig. And what he's saying here, a false teacher, he can be confronted with the truth. He could recognize it, understand it, teach about it. But in the end, he is going to go back to sin. And he's never truly been saved. He's not that new creation. He's not that born again person. He's simply that, that false well. Looks right in the external, but inwardly far from it. One who is driven by the things of this world. So I say to you again that, that we study the word of God so that we can believe in the name of the Son of God, Messiah Yeshua, Jesus Christ. And know, know the moment we believe, know now and know forever that we have eternal life. No one who has truly experienced the wonderfulness of salvation is going to, to give it up. We love our Lord and Savior. And we cannot think about being apart from Him. We want to please Him. That is the nature of a true believer. A true believer, very different than a false teacher. Do not doubt God. Know that you have eternal life through the gospel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Shalom from Israel.